This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of December 23rd, 2019. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael on Tuesdays from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, and SoundCloud pages, and now also on the new Alaska for Sustainable Budgets website, the efforts page on national blog site medium.com, and also on our new podcast page on Spotify. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. In this, our final podcast of the year, we focus on our top three stories from 2019. First, in the end, not even 16 out of 60 in the legislature were, wi were willing to back up the governor on a cuts-only approach. Second, one oil era on the North Slope comes to an end, and an uncertain one comes next. And third, the legislature once again reaffirms this year that it cares more about the top 20% than either the overall Alaska economy or the remaining 80% of Alaska families. And now, let's join Michael. I'm ready to do it, Brad. We need to we need to come down to it for the big the biggest 3 of the year, the 2019 roundup for the for the top 3 of the year. Um, and so let's let's start with number 1. In the end, there weren't even 16 that supported the cuts only. That is your number one discussion talking point for the top uh, top three of the year, number one. It, it is, Michael. I, I think the big story this year, um, uh, well, the big story last year was we, we elected Governor Dunleavy. The big story this year was Governor Dunleavy came in and he was going to do, I think, what what – he had said and what people anticipated he was going to do, he was going to, he was going to cut the size, the, the size and scope of government and came in with a budget to, to, to do that. Um, he had about a billion two in cuts, about 400 uh, million more in, uh, in local taxes. He was going to upstream to the state and he was going to, you know, live within, he was going to finally put the state on a course where, uh, where it lived within its means over the course of the session. Uh, we found out there weren't even 16 out of 60 legislators uh, who were uh, supportive of that. And we ended up with a budget that was, while lower than the previous year, uh, much higher than uh, than what can be supported by uh, just the traditional revenues, plus even uh, uh, the the remaining portion of the, of the POMB draw uh, after dividends. Uh, a much higher spending level than that. So uh, it, the big story to me this year is after after virtually you know five years of people arguing we got to live within our means, we've got to uh, bring spending down to to what revenues uh, can can handle, traditional revenues can handle. Uh, after five years of going through that, after electing a governor who I think was very clear he was going to do that, after a budget process where he tried to do that. Uh, we found out there weren't even 16 out of 60 in the legislature who were willing to back him up uh, when it came to that. And by the 16, I mean people who would who who vote who would vote to uphold the vetoes that 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 were necessary to bring the budget back down to that level after the legislature uh, uh, got finished with uh, got finished messing around with it um, in the in the regular session. And that that to me is is a huge story because it sets the stage for what is going to be happening this coming year and the, and the years after that. Um, we, 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 we tried the cuts only approach. We tried to bring spending down to, um, uh, to levels that, that were supportable from uh, traditional revenues. It didn't work. Uh, there weren't even 16 in the legislature that were going to back that, that backed him up on that. 
Um, and I think that sets the stage for what we've got to do next. I mean, if we're going to keep spending levels up, uh, we've got to face uh, that fact and we've got to deal with uh, what that means uh, over the long term. So that, that to me is the big story, of, uh, the biggest story of the year. Because, again, we're never going to be able to move forward. And you and I have talked about this, that we can't, that the cuts only approach is just not working because there is no uh, 16 involved. And if we want the cuts only, and, and I do, I mean, I'll be honest with you. Uh, I, 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 maybe I, maybe I'm the guy that still believes that yes, Virginia, there is a Santa Claus. I believe we can use a cuts only approach, but what we need is we need people. We need 16 who will hold true, who will hold fast, who will say that, yes, we will make the, take the stand and make the hard choices. That's the only way this cuts only approach would ever work is that we need that 16. And thus far, we just have not had it. No. And, and I, and I, you know, we, we elected people. Um, legislators who I think uh, at least many thought were going to be backing the governor on that approach. And when push came to shove, uh, they just weren't there. I mean, at the end of the day, we ended up even with restored funding to the Arts Council. I know that that's 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 not the biggest item in the budget, but it but to me, it's pretty indicative that if you can't even cut the Arts Council and let that slide to the private sector and let that slide, let, let that responsibility for that go over to the private giving side, if you can't even do that, you're really, I mean, you're really not going to be able to, to, to achieve, achieve cuts only. Um, we, we all know it's, it's, it's technically possible, theoretically possible to do cuts only. I mean, the governor, the governor laid out a budget that, that started down that road. He still had to bring in $400 million from, by upstreaming local taxes, but uh, started down that road. Um, and it takes, it would, it takes big cuts to the university. It takes big cuts to, uh, to Medicaid. It takes, it's going to take, it would take cuts to K through 12. And he started down that road, but you know, he, there were, there was a lot of flack. Um, and at the end you couldn't get 16 to support it. And so he cut a deal with the, with the university that, that, that frankly took cuts only, uh, off the table. I mean, you've got you've got to make the big cut to the university to to get there. So we all know we all know what it would take to do it. Uh, you and I have talked about it. You've talked about it. I've written about it. Uh, we all know uh, where where the dollars are that you have to go to uh, to achieve that. Uh, but 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 you not only need a governor, but you need 16 in the legislature to back him up uh, when it comes to vetoes, and they they just aren't there. Um, Tyler in the chat room kind of sums it up for me, I think, for 20, uh, 2019 looking back. And uh, Tyler says, so change the players and try again. Don't try once and give up and put in taxes. Um, you know, just, just try because that's really the answer. The answer is change the players, you know, change the venue, change the rules, and change the funding. That's what we have to do. Um, and that's really the only choice right now. Otherwise, we will be stuck with some form of taxation, whether it's a taking of the PFD or a flat tax or a progressive tax or a sales tax. That's what's going to happen if we don't make these changes that are required moving forward. Well, yeah, and and I need to I need to make my usual comment of we already we already have taxes. We've right. had taxes the last uh, uh, three years now, four years now. Uh, uh, PFD cuts or taxes. Um, but yeah, I, yes, change the players. That would be great. Um, but I've been at this. You've been at this. I was at this in the 2012 election, the 2014, 2016, 2018. Um, and, and players don't move. And even when you elect players uh, that you think are going to be there, um, I mean, we had, there, there's, there's what? There's a, uh, uh, more than well, there's 18 six. There's 18 in the minority in the in the house. I I, I lose track. Right. Tammy came back over. 18, um, 19, right in there. Yep. Um, so you've got. I mean, you elect players that you think are going to be there. And that's just the house. That's not counting the, the the senators you can count on to get to 16. Um, you elect players that you think are going to be there, and they just aren't there uh, right. when the time comes. I mem- I remember one conversation during the session with one legislator. Uh, who will go unnamed for this purpose. Um, and and when it came time for the vetoes, that legislator wasn't there. Let me use a non-gender <laughs> adjective. Here. That that legislator wasn't wasn't there. <laughs> I didn't did what didn't didn't stand behind the governor. And I wrote a note and said, I'm 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 disappointed. 
And the response was, oh, my, you know, my, people in my district are just, you know, we have to have this or we have to have that. And once you multiply that, you know, it, basically it was I'm there except for these three things, which I have to have out of which I have to have for my district. And once you multiply that by 60 by legislators um, right back, I mean, you're, you're we end up. So, yes, changing the players would be great. Um, but but I <laughs> have having having spent a lot of money in 2012, 2014, 2016, 2018 trying to change players. I don't I don't have a lot of faith that that's that that, that, that process is going to produce a, a different result in 2020. And in the absence of 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 having changed players in the absence of being able uh, to back up these cuts, we are having taxes. We're having PFD cuts. Uh, which have the largest adverse impact on the overall Alaska economy and by far the, the costliest to Alaska families um, in, in terms of the of the way to approach taxes. Um, I'm not sure how many times we need to go through this process of saying, oh, if we can get cuts, uh, let's try for cuts, let's try to have new players. At the end, we fail, and the legislature goes to, to PFD taxes, the worst approach uh, to new to new revenues. I don't know how many times we have to go through that before we sit before we sit there and go, hmm, you know, maybe we ought to now be thinking about a different, less adverse form uh, of revenue because this just isn't working. So, yeah, change players, great idea. Uh, just like cutting the university, great idea. Uh, but but uh, maybe it's my Grinch mode today. But but I just don't I just don't think that's going to happen. Brad's in full on Grinch mode. That's what he's doing. All right. Well. Did you happen to catch this uh, this piece yesterday in KTVA from Kathy Giesel? Did you see the interview with Liz Raines? I did. So t- talk about the lumps of coal. Uh, yeah. Edition. Yeah, she uh, she really just kind of laid it out there, boy. I tell you what, uh, she uh, she kind of just put everything out there that well, we just you know we need that money for government. I mean, that's the whole that was the whole thrust of that whole discussion was. That's government's money, and we're going to do with it what we see fit, and you guys are going to suck it and like it. That was kind of the gist of that whole conversation when it was all said and done. Um, it, it, I mean, I'm just, I was kind of flabbergasted by it. Yeah, well, this, this from the lady who, what, two years ago in her reelection campaign did the cut the ad that uh, put, put it, splicing those two ads, or those two videos together would be an interesting thing. Who, who, you know, two years ago in her in her video ad uh, said that, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's my money. That's not, that's our money. That's not the government's money. Uh, uh, the government's trying to take our money and we need to, and we need to defend it. And to go from that uh, to, to this video where she's talking about, yeah, yeah it's just another part of state revenues. Um, suck it up is um, <laughs> it, it's sort of, I mean, I mean, that makes my point, doesn't it? About, right. about change the players. Yeah. I mean, no, nope. yeah, you elect people thinking they're going to do one thing, um, and but when push comes to shove, uh, in Giesel's case, I mean, she's confronting uh, that we that the state need, on its current spending path, the state need, state needs revenues, um, and, and that's the ta- form of taxation she wants to she wants to pursue taxing the PFD uh, because from from the standpoint of her constituents, which are largely top twenty percent, it's the it's the wealthiest Senate district in the state. Uh, from the from the standpoint of her constituents, they don't want any other form of tax. They want this sort of they want a PFD tax, which pushes the cost of middle and lower income Alaska families. Yeah. So you can't. I mean, yes, you elect the player. Yes, you elect new players, and they tell you certain things. But but when push comes to shove, they just they 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 aren't there. So did you happen? And I mean, again, I don't. This is not, no ego involved here. But did you happen to hear yesterday's show with Mike Shower? I did not. Okay. All right. So we got into a we got into a pretty heavy conversation yesterday about um, the Binding Caucus, and uh, it was right at the end of the show. Pretty heavy discussion, and uh, I already got a call yesterday from from somebody who's involved who said, "Yeah, uh, somebody was listening to you and Shower because uh, there's already pushback on uh, apparently." Um, Shower may lose uh, some staffers over this. There may be a push on trying to get. There's punishment. There's punitive punishment going on for people talking about what's happening in the legislature right now. 
Um, I mean, this is this is the world we live in. I mean, this is like I feel like there should be, uh, you know, a political officer on, on every corner like the old uh, Politburo used to send out, you know, that they had political officers to quell dissident speech uh, in the public square. I mean, this is what it feels like right now to live in the state of Alaska. That's kind of spooky. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, the, 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 the majority in the Senate, the majority leadership in the Senate um, uh, wants to keep on, wants to keep on track. I mean, when you look at the majority leadership in the Senate, the, 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 the leader of the Senate, the, the Senate president is from the wealthiest district in the state, the co-chair of finance who speaks most about uh, PFD issues, most, uh, most on PFD issues is the single wealthiest legislator uh, in the state and is from the second the second wealthiest uh, legis- uh, Senate district uh, in the state. They they're on a mission and their mission is not to have uh, uh, any form of tax that would affect their constituency. They're on a mission to make sure that they continue to use the PFD tax, which pushes costs down to middle and lower income uh, Alaska families. And 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 they're going to exercise their power uh, to, to stay on that mission. Um, I, I, you know, I, that's, that's, that's the reality we're living in. And, and Giesel is not up for reelection this year. Von Imhoff is, but she will swamp just like she did Craig Johnson. Uh, she will swamp whoever runs against her in that district with money. Um, and so there's really, it, it's unrealistic to think we're going to change players like that. Right. I mean, maybe you get Coghill up in Fairbanks, uh, which would be some progress this year, but, but by and large, it's going to be difficult, uh, to change enough of the players, uh, with people who are, who are going to come in there and be resolute, uh, to, to change, change the outcome. Uh, all right. So number one is there's not 16. That's the thing. And of course, we don't we're not going to grow weary and well doing. We're going to keep going. We're going to fight for it. We're going to keep making it in. But, uh, you know, eventually something's going to have to happen. We're going to we're going to have to we will eventually have to make some kind of choice when it's all said and done. Um, All right. So that leads us on here with a couple minutes left in this segment to number two, which we can get started on. Number two is uh, what BP and Hill Corp and Goldman Sachs and everybody else is telling us. About Alaska, uh, there's a, they're telling us a lot. What, what are they telling us, Brad? Well, I think we're going to look back in five years, ten years, and and see the BP Hill Corp uh, uh, transaction, the sale uh, as as a watershed uh, in in Alaska. There there are a lot of good things going on on the North Slope. Um, oil searches, uh, oil search continues to advance. The Pika project. Uh, the one that, that was originally put together by Armstrong Oil, the one that that uh, that a lot of people think is going to produce a lot of oil, uh, uh, not only in terms of daily volume, but but in terms of the life of of production. We have Conoco uh, uh, advancing in the the west side into NPRA and and into developments uh, on the west side, and a lot of those, a number of those uh, have. Uh, have big numbers, uh, big hopes uh, associated with them, um, and and we have the Anwar sale potentially coming up. So so we have there's a lot of good things that are going on uh, on the slope. But I think I think the Hillcorp transaction uh, is telling us, and 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 Conoco's announcement a few weeks ago now that that they're looking to sell a quarter of their interest, a uh, quarter of their West Side interest to to somebody else. I think those are telling us. That we've sort of hit uh, a new stage uh, in Alaska North Slope development. That's not that's that's not going to be major, uh, re- re- not going to be associated with the majors. The majors aren't going to be the ones driving it. Um, and that's that that's that's good and bad. But but the bad part is um, uh, is significant. The bad part is that we won't have the resources of the majors, uh, and we won't have the technical. Uh, skill uh, developed by the majors uh, to really uh, to to continue the advancement of the slope. I think I think in some respects we're sort of seeing the high water mark uh, now of 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 the development uh, of the slope, and we will in five years and ten years time say, yeah, that we can we can see that that 
that uh, uh, BP Hill Corp transaction uh, as a as a demarcation line where things sort of plateaued and things started uh, into a general uh, 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 a different path uh, for the slope going forward. We were talking about number two of our annual top three review. Number two, of course, is what the BP and Hill Corp merger and and uh, the Goldman Sachs discussion and everything else is telling us about the state of Alaska. Brad was calling it a watershed moment. Brad, uh, what uh, you, you were going to go into some details on that. Well, so BP Hill Corp, I think, is, is an indication that, that the majors have lost interest, the major oil companies have lost interest um, uh, in the North Slope. Conoco still... Um, Conoco is a major independent. It's not a major oil company in, in the definition that people use of that term anymore. Um, but, but Conoco is still certainly a, a large oil company that's interested up there. But even Conoco has announced that they're looking to sell a quarter of their interest uh, on the slope uh, uh, to, to somebody else. Um, so I think, I think we're seeing uh, sort of the high watermark of, of the interest of the majors um, in the slope. Or we've seen we're seeing the passing of the high water mark of the uh, of the of the interest of the majors in the slope, and that and I think that's a big deal uh, in terms of the financial resources that they can bring, majors can bring to projects, uh, uh, the management that they can bring to to major projects, and in terms of the technology they bring to major projects. I think I think we're going to suffer from not having major oil companies uh, interested in the slope anymore. And then Goldman Sachs is a, is a slightly different thing, but I think also indicates also as an indicator of, uh, of, of where we may be headed with, uh, with oil development in the state. Goldman Sachs is a major investment bank. Uh, uh, a lot of people would say the major investment bank uh, uh, globally. Um, uh, they, they lead the way in terms of, Thinking about about uh, uh, investing in things, what to invest in, where to invest, uh, what technologies to invest in, or what new what emerging companies to invest in, uh, a big deal uh, uh, in the in the investment world. Um, and as as those who have read the front pages of the paper uh, or listened to the newscast know, uh, Goldman Sachs uh, last week announced that. Uh, they were uh, uh, not going to invest in new Arctic projects in Alaska. They called out Alaska specifically uh, and identified ANWR uh, uh, specifically as projects that they were no longer going to invest in. And there's been a lot of pushback from the state, and, that, and that's uh, and that's appropriate that we that we push back. Uh, but I but I think we have to recognize what's going on here. Goldman's doing that not out of not out of any great um, environmental urge they've wrapped it in that language uh, but but what Goldman <laughs> gold I know I know Goldman well from my days as a as a lawyer um, what Goldman it, at, at the end of the day what Goldman is is all about money and all about risk and all about uh, uh, good investments um, and what Goldman is really saying uh, is uh, Arctic development in Alaska is risky uh, extremely risky. Uh, there are other places to put your money in the oil and energy business that are less risky, uh, uh, have uh, more profit uh, potential, uh, less 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 risk, more profit potential uh, than Alaska projects. Um, and we just uh, and and we're just we we don't see that as a place uh, uh, where as a good place to put our money anymore. Now they're sort of wrapping that in an environmental package. Uh, uh, to sort of to sort of fit with political correctness uh, in the current world, but at the core of it, it's 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 a statement more about what they see about uh, the, the the risk profile of Alaska investments um, than than anything else. And I and I think we have to I think we have to recognize uh, that that that's going to have an, an impact on Alaska. Not it, not so much Goldman. Goldman's money itself, but I think that's an indicator uh, of of other of what others are thinking about the profitability of Alaska. They won't wrap it in an environmental package in the same way that Goldman has. Uh, but I think I think we're seeing the investment world view things like shale oil development in the in the lower 48, uh, and indeed uh, renewable uh, development, uh, wind wind farms and solar, as better places to put their money. Uh, than on the North Slope. Now, as I say, uh, we've got—I mean, we've got a good story going on on the North Slope in terms of 
what Oil Search is doing with Pika and what Conoco is doing out west. Um, but I, I think we're gradually seeing the world say, hey, there's more oil in the world than there is demand, um, uh, not only currently, but over the long term. Uh, and there are better places to, to, to invest in for oil development uh, over the long term than, than, than what we view as a, as a risky investment in Alaska. So I, 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 think, I think we need to understand those things. And, and you know, when, when some people say, oh, oil development, the oil is going to be the cavalry that comes over the hill that saves us uh, in terms of oil development uh, and in terms of, in terms of price, I, th I think we need to discount those things because the world's trying to tell us uh, that, you know, maybe Alaska isn't, isn't, isn't all that we, all that we in Alaska would like to think it is. Uh, the rest of the world's telling us that Alaska's sort of become a marginal oil province, and that means we need we need to focus even harder on getting our fiscal house in order. Well, uh, it, uh, long term. Yeah, and you see, because I mean, I the way I, what I read into this, and what I think a lot of people read into this was that this, this was Goldman Sachs kind of virtue signaling that they were part of that woke generation where they weren't going to drill in all these sensitive areas. But you're you're one of the few that I'm seeing say that, no, this is the indicator that Alaska is becoming less relevant as an oil uh, as an oil uh, producing uh, area. Is that kind of that sums up what you're basically saying? Yeah, I, I think that's accurate. I mean, as I say, I've been around the Goldman people a lot in my life, a lot. Uh, and And at the end of the day, these guys are very hard-nosed business people in terms of in terms of investing their money and 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 taking into account a lot of factors and in investing their money. I think they wrap this up in a package that that sort of fits the the woke generation, if you will. But at the at uh, I I know them well enough to know that it's a hardcore business decision that's that's behind that. So. Um, okay. I think it's tell I think it's telling us things that we need to listen to. All right, let's move on to number three here. We got about four minutes. The uh, legislature, uh, you say, and I would agree, seems to care more about the top twenty percent than the overall Alaska economy or Alaska families. Yeah, and and Geisel's, uh the the video from Geisel is as good a place to to sort of summarize that as as anything else. Uh, uh, We've got a legislature legislature that is that is going to push legislative leadership that is going to push for PFD cuts uh, to fund government, and PFD cuts are nothing more than a tax on middle and lower income Alaska families. It takes more from middle and lower income Alaska families than it does from the top 20%. It's a it's a good way for the for the top 20% uh, to finance the state because. They avoid sales taxes. They avoid income taxes. They avoid any sort of taxes that, that materially affect them. Uh, they push that responsibility off on middle and lower income uh, Alaska families. And and it's not. This isn't a hidden issue. I mean, this isn't a hidden hidden consequence. The 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 2016 ICER study was very clear. Uh, and I'll quote it again. Uh, quote: The impact <laughs> of the PFD cut falls almost exclusively on residents. And it is highly regressive, so it has the largest adverse impact on the economy per dollar of revenues raised. It's not. This isn't a hidden issue. Um, and there's another ICER study that talks about how bad PFD cuts are on for Alaska families, the bulk of Alaska families. There's an ITEP study that talks about the the, re, the regress, re, regressivity of the of the of the PFD tax. So th this isn't a hidden issue. This isn't like oh they don't understand, they don't know. They know exactly what they're doing. And, and, and what they are doing is they are consciously, intentionally pushing the costs of Alaska government off on middle and lower income Alaska families and, and, and insulating the top 20% from having to pay their proportionate share of the cost of government. Um, and that's the, that's, the, that's the state legislature we have uh, right now. So it's, I th I, that's a big deal. When, when you've got a legislature that is consciously, intentionally, knowingly protecting the top 20 percent by pushing costs off on the remaining 80 percent that's a big deal it is and and of course um 
they've continued to push. And you could see where some of these people, again, I think you mentioned earlier, uh, some of the folks who have been most reticent are those that are from some of the most affluent areas. They they represent some of the most affluent constituencies or they themselves are part of that, you know, top one, two, three, four, five percent where they would personally be on the hook for thousands and thousands of dollars in taxes. And they're much more comfortable. Um, they're much more comfortable, um, you know, allowing everybody else to shoulder that burden. Uh, all right, Brad, um, final thoughts here. I'll let you do a, I'll let you do a two minute wrap here before we, we Christmas it up here at the end. Well, Michael, I, it's just, it's the same thing as I was saying at the end of the at the end of the broadcast segment. We we've got to the the the, the twenty teens uh, uh, were the best of times in terms of high oil prices and high revenues um, and that that funded high spending, and the worst of times in the sense that those revenues came down, oil prices came down to earth, uh, oil production has sort of has sort of plateaued, um, and and we now have to confront. Uh, and and the latter part of the of the decade was 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 the beginning of having to confront that. That's not changing going forward into the 2020s. Uh, and 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 that is going to be confronting that is going to be the 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 issue of at least the early 2020s. Uh, and I'm not I'm not I, I I am not satisfied how the state's doing that. I mean we we've got a legislature legislative leadership. Uh, now that is being run for the benefit of the top 20 percent uh, to push costs to the remaining 80 percent uh, and we've got a legislative leadership that that because they don't have to pay for it uh, they're perfectly content with allowing big government to to continue uh, because it's being funded by somebody else heck you know you, more government somebody else is going to pay for it i'm not going to stop that um and and so the 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 challenge of the early 2020s is going to be either coming to grips with that and and people just accepting it or continuing to fight it and change it um and i think that's i think that is the issue um uh, that we're that we're now going to move into in the early 2020s are we going to continue to have government run for the benefit of the top 20 percent or are we going to 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 try to bring all to try to bring uh, all alaskans uh, along uh, in paying for the cost of government and as a consequence consequence of that once all alaskans have to pay then all alaskans start trying to uh, trying to reduce the cost of government well, <clears throat> I hope that uh, I hope that people get motivated. You know, I guess if you can't motivate, you irritate or you agitate. Maybe that's what we got to do here, Brad. Maybe that's what we are doing, and uh, and I hope we're right. I hope people wake up and get up off their rusty dusties and uh, and move forward on this. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board. Merry Christmas to you. Happy New Year, Mike. Michael, as always, uh, thank you and Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to you as well. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember, you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and now our Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next year, first week of January, on the weekly top three.